All and good. Everyone. Yeah. Yeah. All good. Great. All good. It'll be interesting um, when we do the the US interviews. So it's six a.m. here in Australia now. Um, we don't actually get many people jumping on live just because almost yeah. all of the people who are interested in listening um, are at work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, do, you, but, yeah. do you get many people who listen back afterwards? Is it has that gone well? Or? Well, based on downloads, we, yeah, it's been really interesting. Um, at downloads and DMs, um, mm. like people saying, hey, thanks for that or whatever. That, yeah. That's been pretty good. Um, but what I got a, a bit of a false sense of, um, I don't know what you call progression, false sense of feedback is we started these during the Corona lockdown. Oh yeah. And so that was number one. And number two, um, I started them with Aussies. So we were meeting kind of in the middle of the day and everyone was locked down. So we were getting easy 50 people live. Um, well, I'm sorry, not easy 50 people live. We peaked at 50 people live. And, um, but we were getting a lot of 30, you know, and then there was a noticeable drop off when lockdown ended. Um, because, you know, 6 a.m., yeah. gym, gyms are open, personal trainers, young strength and conditioning coaches, everyone's sort of doing it. And if you're a little bit older, uh, but I like the idea of keeping it. Oh, one thing, the live part is a little bit more stressful because we had, um, like, some people just, couldn't make it at the last second. I'm trying to think. Oh, Nick Grantham. I don't know if you know Nick. Um, yeah. Something happened with his their trading and they rescheduled at a different time. Um, so you feel bad when people are kind of. Oh, yeah, they're ready running. to go. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. And they want to listen to Nick. And then I'm like, okay, cool. We, we, we change it to an AMA. Yeah. And stuff. Um, but yeah. Anyway, so I think we'll, we'll just get started. Yeah. Perfect. So, Carol, fit for golf. Good to chat. I've got uh, four themes that I'm really keen to chat about. So one is your, your golf strength and conditioning. Uh, two is the app that you've designed. Three is working online and four is working in the US. So uh, Mike, can you just give us a quick one minute? Tell us a little bit about how you got to working in the US as an Irishman in golf strength and conditioning. Yeah, so did exercise science in the University of Limerick in Ireland was very interested in strength and conditioning based on kind of sporting background and just enjoy training. I was working in a gym in Cork called Fitness Works um, after college, set up sort of full time as an independent personal trainer slash SNC coach. And one day just saw a tweet from the TPI, who were Titleist Performance Institute, one of the leaders in kind of golf, I suppose, uh, training education. Um, they advertised a post for a, a gym called Hanson Fitness for Golf in Orange County, California, uh, that they were looking for a TPI certified coach, which I was. It was about 5.45 a.m. in November in Ireland. It was freezing cold and raining just after getting soaked, opening up the gate to the uh, industrial park where the gym was. So I uh, thought that some time in Orange County, California might be nice. I was single, recently out of college, no real ties to home apart from family. Sent a message to Mike Hansen, the owner of the gym. Long story short, uh, 10 months later, moved to uh, Southern California, started working for him, have been here since. And then the Fit for Golf stuff is the kind of name that I was trading under when working with golfers in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And I kept that up in an online capacity through the usual social media platforms and a website. Okay. That's interesting. So can you just tell me, because I've seen that TPI, um, it's a specific golf certification. What do you learn in there that's, um, maybe either accelerates your development or accelerates your, your knowledge of golf compared to just being a strength and conditioning coach and doing, I don't know, self-analysis and all that kind of stuff. What is the certificate? So TPI have a, a really good educational pathway, in my opinion. Um, when you sign up to do a TPI course, the first one that everybody does, regardless of whether you are a strength and conditioning coach, a physio, a golf instructor, um, a medical professional, or just someone who loves golf, everybody does what's called TPI level one. Mm -hmm. And their goal with TPI level one, it was a 
I think it's a weekend course, or it was when I did it anyway, a two-day course. They try and get everybody from the different professions on the same page in regards to basic things that are important from a global movement standpoint in the golf swing. Okay. So what was really interesting, uh, I went to TPI level one with one of my really good buddies who was a professional golf instructor at the time. And I was a professional S and C coach working with golfers at the time. And that course is literally split in half where half of it is called fitness. It's basically the physical side of it. Mm -hmm. And then the other half is called golf. So they're trying to get the trainers up to speed on say the key terms and phases of the golf swing. And they're trying to get the golf instructor up to speed with the key anatomy and biomechanics sort of principles that the S&C coach would understand. At the end of it, you do a exam and then you are TPI level one certified. And what happens then is if, so TPI has a level two and level three after that, but they split you into different pathways. So as an S&C coach, I go and do golf fitness level two and three, as a golf instructor, you go and do golf level two and three. Mm-hmm. If you're really into um, if you're really into uh, treatment, there's a there's a medical level two and level three. But the idea of the level one, which is by far the most popular, is essentially get trainers understanding what goes on in the golf swing from a pretty global or kind of I suppose gross basic standpoint, and get the golf instructors understanding. Uh, how physical limitations can can impact that. So without getting too, too uh, kind of crazy down it, they have um, what they call their body swing connection, which is, okay, these are, say, the key areas of the golf swing that are important to be in particular movement ranges for a successful swing. That's what golf instructors would know inside out. So when they're looking at golf swings, they'd be able to kind of say like, mm, I don't really like the way that that person is say moving their right shoulder. Yep. But what they might not have any idea of is why that person's right shoulder is moving in a certain way. They could mm-hmm. have had a right shoulder injury and have you know hugely deficient internal rotation or something yep. like that. And it's a yep. case of teaching me how to spot the the flaw or the tendency in the movement. Flaw is not the right word. And teach. Uh, the golf instructor to think you can't just teach this 50 year old with a shoulder injury to try and have the same right shoulder position as tiger woods because he has 30 degrees less shoulder rotation available you yep. can try and get everyone on the same page there so i thought it was it was really really good from from that standpoint so as a, a golfer who as a youngster played up a five handicap uh you doing that course how, how much did you you feel was just to tick the box let me get the certificate and compared to like things that you actually explicitly learned from from the golfing side of that there was definitely it was definitely not just a ticking the box experience for me um i would have considered myself reasonably well versed in the golf swing and and pretty well versed in kind of strength and conditioning physiology stuff like that but what was really interesting when we were there is and they get they're kind of controversial topic, I suppose, in uh, in S and C circles, depending on what corner of Twitter you live on. But they teach you uh, a movement screen, and what was really interesting for me with the movement screen was that yes, I learned a way of screening people to assess their mobility. But what was more important for me was by learning some of the more in depth kind of biomechanics principles that underpinned what they put in their screen, it improved my program design in terms of types of movements that I was trying to get people more mobile and more powerful in. Um, That's what it really helped me with. Something I probably would have figured out, say, eventually, but literally immediately after coming home from the course, I started assessing the golfers I was training with differently. And they started programming a little bit differently, um, which which was a, a big deal. And I still still use some of the concepts that I picked up in that level one course now. And that was in two thousand and that was in two thousand and fifteen. And like I'm however many thousands of hours of you know coaching or however many hundreds of players later, you know. 
if, but, but that's a good um, that's a good recommendation or good good philosophy that you can if you if you can apply that because sometimes I wonder about these certificates and I've seen the TPI one and um, yeah. Uh, you know, just have my questions just in general from how you yeah. certificates. Like the, the only, like I am, TPI have been unbelievably supportive of me. Like they've, they've given me like a massive platform. They've published 10 of my articles. They've, they've retweeted and, and reposted literally dozens of, of training videos of tutorials and stuff like that. The only, I don't know if criticism is the fair, fair word, but their assessment process is quite weak is the uh, the only thing that I would say if you so that's coming you, out of the, the you've done the you're talking about that assessment so yeah once you've done the course yep. the the assessment to get your certificate is extremely easy like it's a it's a multiple choice exam which you can have open book or internet open you can do it in your own time and you've three opportunities to pass it so it's it's very difficult to fail the test but the information you're getting is superb mm -hmm. and you also have the um like once you've done the course you have a online uh, like say dashboard where you can go back and look at all the lectures and all this stuff so i think most of the people who come out of it they they do have a, a good understanding of what they've been doing my only i suppose qualm would be and maybe this isn't tpi's fault it's more a perception standpoint is that you need to be very careful when you hear the term TPI certified and what that actually means because yep. you could literally have a trainee golf instructor with zero physical training SNC sports science background three days later being TPI certified screening people and prescribing sure. prescriptions yep. whereas you could also have somebody who is a PhD, has 30 years of training elite and general population clients, and them also being TPI certified. And you go to the same people for a, a TPI assessment or a TPI program, or they're sure. both working with a TPI certified trainer. That's kind of when the waters get muddied a little bit, um, but that's that's probably not their fault, you know? Yeah, uh, I'd suppose that that's similar to like a CSCS or something like that, where uh, it's actually one of the things that I do like about what the ASCA, the Australian Strength and Conditioning Association are doing is this, there's level one, level two, level three, and that's fairly distinguishable. And then from level two, I think it's from level two, there's what's called the pro scheme, which is uh, it's something like associate, professional, elite, and master coach. So you've kind of got these, you can distinguish to quite a level because um, level one, level two, level three is almost like um, your academic theoretical stuff. And then the pro scheme of having associate, what did I say? Associate, professional, elite, and master has other things in, involved. So you have to have yeah. worked eight years in this environment, working with this level of athletes to get um, the next step. And, and I think it's quite a useful. Um, yeah, I think, I think to be fair to TPI, like I, I definitely don't want to sound too critical of their assessment process at all. And I think one of the reasons why it's probably not say extremely stringent is based on the fact that they're trying to help as many coaches as possible, yep. get a decent footing in stuff that they need to understand to literally just be able to help golfers. Yep. And you can help a golfer. You don't have to be a super genius and understand everything inside out to help your average player. And if, yep. People were paying a thousand dollars to do the two-day course, and there was a fifty percent failure rate, and you don't get your certification. Well, then there's not going to be many people going to do it. Yeah, you know, no. is uh, is the other side of it. Yeah, no, always a, always a balance. In fact, I I do kind of almost I can see why a level, especially that introduction level, would be easy to get in and easy to get out because yeah, that kind of gets you into the system, and then you probably can. Well, put it this way: if they're not in the system. TBI can't help them, so I totally understand yeah. that. No, no, definitely. I, I, would, I would agree with that. Um, no, okay, so I've, I've only worked um, two golfers, both on the senior tour, uh, senior Asian tour, I think it was. Um, and t tell me right now, as a golf strength and conditioning coach, you would be on social media and you've seen what other people are programming. What are some of the myths and misconceptions that's happening in golf that you just want to pull your hair out? 
I think you need to start with how can you actually help golf? What's the biggest impact you can make with golfers as an SNC coach? So like obviously golf has loads of developments go into it. You have, they primarily break golf down into four categories. You have off the tee, which most people would understand as driving. You have approach, which is hitting generally your second shot towards the green. Mm -hmm. You have short game or around the green, which is if you miss the green, kind of chipping, pitching, that sort of stuff. And then you have putting. The big thing that you can help people with are definitely off the tee and also approach. You're not really helping anyone with their around the green or putting. And if you claim that you are, I'd like to hear your, your rationale, you know? Gotcha. So really what you're looking at then is you're looking at the golf swing. How, how can we impact that? The demands of golf are basically golf shots. We've already kind of confirmed that we're not helping them with their chipping and their putting motions because there's no real um, benefit to being in good physical shape or not. It's like, it's like playing snooker or throwing a dart. There's no real, uh, no real physical capacity required. So you have golf swings, often which are, are um, hopefully at high power outputs. And you have slow walking with lots of breaks in between your shots for approximately four to five hours. It's not very hard to train for slow walking with lots of breaks if you're in any sort of reasonable condition. So really then what we're looking at is we have a golf swing, which is a kind of full body rotational power move that takes approximately a second. And we know from looking through statistics for all levels of golfer that there's a very, very strong relationship with how much speed you can produce in that golf swing and the standard of golf that you're likely to be able to play. It's not a perfect correlation and it doesn't guarantee everything, but there's definitely prerequisites in terms of speed that if you're not meeting, you're just making your chances of getting to the level you want to minute. So yeah. then where you, where I go into kind of in my thinking is, okay, the big thing that I have that I can help golfers with is their club head speed potential mm -hmm. and also just giving them the resiliency and the durability to practice and play as much as they see fit without picking up injuries or being tired and, and not able to do it basically. All right. So a golfer comes to you, um, based, based on that understanding, what, what is your process taking them through before they even lift their first or before you even program the first program? I'm guessing that there's obviously a screening component, which you've touched on both from TPI and, and um, your own screening. What, what are you looking for there? Ranges of movement, uh, what restrictions, what, what strength testing are you looking at there? Yeah, like that's, that's a good question and something that I kind of throw around in my head a lot. In the last few years, I've probably moved a little bit away from formal screening, um, mainly because I think players get a little bit obsessed with their screening numbers. But and really what I want... Ch chasing those numbers? Yeah. So, like... I think as soon as you start measuring, say, a squat, a bench press, a vertical jump, a pull-up, whatever you're using, and if you're giving player feedback on those training numbers, so they say those testing numbers once every, let's just say once every three months or something, if the player's number, it's, it's too easy for a strength and conditioning coach, in my opinion, to fall into the trap of, oh, look, these numbers are improving. We're doing a great job. But we've no idea if it's transferring to the sport is, is the player's club head speed going up. And then on the flip side, I'm looking at any of those strength or power or mobility screen checklists. Okay. They might help me inform my programming a little bit, but I also don't care in the slightest how those exercises are changing unless they're transferring to the golf swing. So if the club head speed is going up, but that person has kept the same weight on their bar or they've kept the same vertical jump power output for the last three months, I'm way happier in that regard because yep. the person might be three or five miles an hour faster, you know? Okay. So, so everything, I don't want, I'm trying to get the balance here. Is everything geared towards that club head speed or is that an oversimplification? No, not, not in my opinion, not really, unless, the golfer that's coming to me or the person, maybe the golfer's coach or say physio or someone like that that has referred the golfer to me 
has given me some other information that I need to take into account. So near, and it, it depends a little bit too, and this is obviously the same in other sports, but what's interesting about golf is you don't really get 50 year old recreational Aussie rules or rugby players. Yep. Whereas you, you do with golfers. So if you consider an elite golfer, let's say a, a college, like a college scholarship or a national level amateur or a professional tour player, not all the time, but nearly all the time when they are assessed or by looking at their golf swing and because of the level they've gotten to, you can almost assume, almost not definitely, that their mobility is pretty good. Their range of motion is quite good. You can nearly tell this by looking at their golf swing. So then what I want to know is what are your speeds? Because if, if you have a, like the average club head speed on the PGA Tour is 115 miles per hour. So what this means is that the, the golf, the, the golf club, the head of the club that's hitting the ball is moving at 115 miles per hour on average when a PGA Tour player hits the ball. Yep. If a golfer comes to me, he's not injured, he has aspirations of making it on the PGA Tour, and he tells me his club head speed is 108 miles an hour. Well, then what I'm looking at is you have such low hanging fruit for getting your club head speed up which is definitely going to help improve your scoring potential. Let's look at the things that can impact that the most. Mm -hmm. I think there, as an SNC coach, there's way, way more potential to help them with things like that than looking into, well, if we improved your external shoulder rotation by five degrees, maybe your swing would look a little bit nicer on camera, or you might have a three yard less dispersion in terms mm -hmm. of right and left or something like that. Like, I, I don't think that that's where we can make our impact. It's, yep. it's really, you're often dealing with players who are, how I explain it to a lot of them is, they're 9.5 or 9.9 .9 out of 10 in terms of golf technique and skill, but they might be three out of 10 in terms of power development. Yep. And if you can bring that three out of 10 for power development up to a six or seven out of 10 over six months or a year or higher over a longer period, and you have that exact same golfer who's already highly skilled, but you've changed him from 108 miles an hour to 115 miles an hour, that's a completely different golfer. And for people who kind of aren't familiar with speeds and stuff like that, if you consider um, a, a tour level golfer, every four miles per hour of club head speed is worth about 10 yards in distance. So one okay. mile per hour, every one mile an hour is about two and a half yards. So if you can look at four miles per hour, it's about 10 yards. And if you can get eight miles per hour, it's 20 yards. And if you're anywhere in or in that range, like that is massive for golfers. Reason yeah. being is that the strongest rule or law in golf is that the closer you are to the hole after your tee shot, the less strokes on average it's going to take you to get the ball into the hole. Sure. So if I'm playing you on a golf hole, Brant, and the hole is 400 yards long, and you hit your drive 300 yards and I hit my drive 250 yards. Even if you're in, say, the semi-rough, the, the grass that's not as well manicured as the fairway, if we're at the same skill level, i.e. say tour or college golf, and you're hitting your shots from 100 yards away from the green after your 300-yard drive, and I'm hitting my shots from 150 yards away from the green after my 250-yard drive, nearly all the time you're going to put the ball closer to the hole than me and then you're going to have a way better chance of holding your pot. So there's a much better likelihood of you having a three than there is me. And when you work that out over the course of a season, even, even a golf round mm -hmm. or a golf tournament or a season or a career, that makes a huge difference. And like sure. that's, that's irrefutable based on the statistics that we see. Like there's people, there's people uh, boiling down those statistics literally for a living that we can easily look at, you know? Oh, okay. So it, it really simplifies it right down to, the, there's um, a lot of clarity that gives, um, for, you know, if, if I'm starting out with a, a, a goal for whatever levels to, to aim for that. Now, when, when we look at this, and when I look at the sport of golf, I, I just see so many gimmicks. Uh, paging through a golf magazine, there's all these things. Um, what, what are some of the, the big frustrations from your side with SEC and strength or physical conditioning for golf? The first one, Sorry. yeah, like the, 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 the main one is definitely just forgetting that golf is a power sport. 
like it takes. So this would be kind of uh, rudimentary stuff for the SNC coaches listening, but just getting your, your energy system and your demands understood. So like the swing takes one second, literally takes one second, about 0.75 seconds on the way back and about 0.25 seconds from there to impact. And you have five to 10 minutes of slow walking in between. So like we're not under any pressure to recover in between bouts of activity. So I like to almost look at it as say like a, a thrower, like a, a track and field throwing athlete. Yeah. You, you're looking for huge power outputs in a very short duration of time. And then we also have the fact that a golf club is very light. Golf club weighs about 350 grams, a driver, which is not heavy. And that changes, I think, the training approach for someone who's trying to swing that as quickly as possible versus someone who gets points for moving heavier and heavier objects. Um, so, so, so just going back to your track and field athlete, it's more like working with a javelin thrower than it is a shot putter. Yeah, exactly. Because the object is lighter. Is, yep. is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah, I think like the, one of the sort of learning things that I've had over the kind of recent months or years is that the lighter the object that you're using in your sport, the less time there is available to apply force to it. Mm-hmm. And therefore the less uh, carryover there is from maximal strength levels or maximal strength improvements to that activity. Obviously not saying that strength isn't valuable. It is, but it brings up the question of how much do you need? Where does the focus of the training go? And again, what's actually making an impact on that golfer's club head speed. So again, this comes back to, uh, uh, I noticed in my own evolution is as a young coach, I chased maximums. You know, like I wanted to get you as strong as possible or squat, squat mm-hmm. as much as possible, bench press, whatever it is. Yeah. Whereas now I look at my, well, my own training and for my athletes is I'm looking at just getting your minimums up. So to, to hit thresholds. Does that make yeah. sense? Is that, is that yeah. what you're trying to do with your... Yeah, yeah, your... definitely. So I, I kind of missed the, the sort of answer to your last question in terms of the things that I see that are the problems. People are just using watered down training methods. So they might pick good exercises or potentially useful exercises, but they're doing them with intensity levels and outputs that aren't going to make a bottom line on that real maximal short effort um, movement. So if we just pick a simple one that I program for people all the time, let's just say a rotational medicine ball throw, standing side onto a wall, and you're Mm -hmm. basically similar to the movement of a golf swing, you're flinging the ball off the wall as hard as you can. Like that exercise can, in my opinion, be very effective if done for extremely low reps with extremely high power outputs. But you often see it being performed, people just going kind of going through the motions for yeah. higher rep sets. And again, that kind of comes back to the point too of like if you have your 50 year old who's not used to training, probably will help them because because they're they need such a low stimulus to to help. But if you have someone who's hit millions of golf shots in their life and they're they're a professional golfer and they're trying to get from let's say 112 to 116 miles per hour club head speed like they need really potent stimulus to to increase you know Mm -hmm. Um, and in regards to the the minimum threshold stuff what's interesting there is there's obviously a number of ways that you can try and help someone improve like the the kind of fancy even though it's an old-fashioned term would be sort of speed strength yep. if you think of someone who's swinging a golf club um can can you help a golfer improve their club head speed by giving them a say power lifting or weight lifting biased program and get their max strength up 100 percent, absolutely mm-hmm. can you also get a golfer to increase their club head speed by giving them a lighter more velocity orientated training plan full of things like jumps and med ball throws and uh, cable pulley rotation work and say lighter uh, barbell exercises or dumbbell exercises with a, with a focus on velocity. Yes, you can. But what you need to consider, and I learned this very quickly this year when I started working with some professionals is there's going to be a huge difference in terms of fatigue, soreness, how long the sessions take, and how comfortable that player is doing those sessions unsupervised between those two things. 
Like I have a very hard time telling a golfer worth literally who's earned $40 million in his career. Okay. You're doing bench press today, three by three with 90% of your one rep max go. And then I want, and then you're going to do it unsupervised because he's on the other side of the country during COVID yeah. as opposed to, I'm going to get you to do single arm med ball shot puts with an eight pound medicine ball off the wall as hard as you can for five sets of three each side. Yeah. You know, is there a difference between obviously there is training differences there in terms of adaptations, but if both of those are moving the needle on club head speed at reasonably the same level, it's very, very hard to pick the one that causes more fatigue, more soreness. The athlete is less comfortable with, there's more chance of them injuring their $40 million shoulder yeah. and, uh, and just, just time and, and convenience basically. Which, which is, is fascinating because um, that opens us up, and I, I want to go to, on, to your online programming off the back of that, but it's fascinating to me because so many opportunities, at least in Australia, with strength and conditioning is to work in rugby union, rugby league, Aussie rules. These are contact sports where increasing strength and increasing muscle mass can happen at the same time. For most of that population, it's going to be a benefit if you can put five kgs on your young athlete that you're working or your club footy player or whatever. All those intro level jobs, that's the easy part to do. And so we default to that. And then like the challenges that I had working with tennis players and um, what you're talking about golf there, like when you were saying that, Tennis players were on court three, three to five hours a day, four to six days a week. You can't induce DOMS. Or, well, not that you can't, but they need to be able to play straight after the gym session or at least tomorrow. Yeah. And so that whole thing that had, you know, I started working with tennis about 10 years into my, um, into my career. And I, I felt very ill-prepared because, uh, you know, body splits programs don't really work because we can't have a leg day because they need to be fresh for legs. You know, you can't have two or oh, three yeah. legs off. They, they, their legs are going running around a tennis court for four hours. E exactly. Every exactly. day. Exactly. And so all these different factors had to come into my programming, which had absolutely like no course, no certificate, no, nothing really prepared me for that. Um, yeah. not the big thing, but you start to notice, oh, wait a second. Okay, so they've been on court, then they come into the gym, they're going to go back on court again. I can't do, you know, I have to, my exercise selection has a totally different criteria. Like you just talked about the, the uh, bench press versus the, um, you know, the that ball throw. Machine. Yeah, that ball throw. And yeah, it was, it was just a fascinating um, evolution in my own thinking. So yeah, I think, like, I think the, the level of skill and say preciseness for want of a better word in the sport will have a big impact on the type of fatigue or soreness that you can invoke. So I've done a lot of work in field sports too. And I, I've played a lot of field sports and like Gaelic football was probably say my best sport, which is similar to, to Aussie rules. Yep. And yeah, let, like, let's just say if I had a, had a training session on a Tuesday and I lifted pretty heavy on a Monday, like I can go to that training and I'm, I'm a bit sore. Let's say I did just, you know, something like a, a four by four uh, squat, deadlift, bench and overhead press or something like that. You know, you're kind of compound barbell lifts and maybe some hypertrophy work or whatever, maybe some jumping or Olympic lifts. And if I go to that training session the next day and I'm kind of sore, kind of stiff, and even if this is, I'd say, a pro level, which I, I haven't worked at, I think it's easier to get through a session like that and sort of not be found out as such because the margins for how you're doing aren't really clear to see. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like if, yep. if you're, pra if you're practicing plays and something like rugby or Aussie rules, it's very hard to, it's very hard for someone to tell, like if you're a little bit sore or a little bit off, maybe they're using mm -hmm. GPS, but if you have a golfer, like the ball flight is so, so ruthless. And the way that they're tracking it with the launch monitors in terms of, they're going to know straight away if the speed is down. If they feel sore, it's going to have a huge impact on what they can do with their swing. And there's no real option. Like in, in, if you're running around tackling people or running around hand passing and kicking, yes, you're not going to be 100%. But I think there's definitely a difference between trying to get through one of those sessions when you're a bit sore and stiff 
versus you're standing over a golf ball for three or four hours and your lower back is sore and you can't rotate as much as you'd like to or your chest is killing you and you feel like that when your arm goes across your body that your pec is is you know really really sore and stiff mm -hmm. and i think that's kind of like what you were saying about tennis it's just when the skill is so precise or the movement is so fine that's when i think you need to be really when the, the sort of bandwidth for for moving away from your optimal is small that's where you need to be really careful with the uh with the loading protocols especially when like there's a big question mark over do we actually need those loading protocols to make progress like mm -hmm. you, you you can't just train a rugby player with with jumps and throws if they're not able to hold on enough muscle mass and strength mm -hmm. to tackle someone to the ground whereas a golfer might need to get that stronger muscle mass at all and they don't have to train as hard but they can still have their speed go yeah and while you're saying that i'm sort of reflecting on another part is that's in strength and conditioning <laughs> i don't know if you feel the same way but there's this hierarchy that if you work in the football codes or those you know whether it's nfl gaelic football aussie rules rugby union rugby league there's definitely a hierarchical uh, we'll put it this way if there was a conference and there was someone talking on golf strength and conditioning and football strength and conditioning, um, I think that the football one would be more popular. Um, yeah. And, and definitely, I felt that. Like, I felt that, um, I don't know, maybe it's just my own perception, but that was something that I was really interested in to go into football because I considered it higher. And yet, yeah. when you talk about the balances there, you have to be way more precise in your programming. You have to be because you, your margin for error, like one degree, I'm guessing with your um, the way your club faces, yeah. you have a massive. Um, and and the other thing that's really tough there, like, is that there's a few things like in that there's so much goes into say golf score. You can do, and this is kind of true in other sports too, but you can do a really good job with the strength and conditioning and the player can just play terribly because mm -hmm. golf is so variable. Like the, the outcomes of golf performance are so random that it's really hard to know. And there's, there's no real way of proving it if your training program is helping or not. Like, yes, you can look at their, say, speeds on the course in terms of how, how fast their club is moving and how far their ball is going. But like, if, if that's, say, similar, or you're happy with how that's going, but their score is getting worse, well, then it's a case of, okay, the strength and conditioning is helping based on what I'm trying to improve or what I've been hired to improve, but they can still go through a period where their putting is off, which you have nothing to do with. Yep. Maybe they're not really seeing eye to eye with their swing coach, or maybe because golf is so variable, like you, it's, it's not, it's not uh, uncommon to see a professional golfer have a difference of say honestly like six to eight to ten strokes in difference mm -hmm. from a thursday round to a friday round that happens mm -hmm. all the time which yes. is a huge huge difference yep whereas if you're playing something like rugby yes we've good and bad performances but so much of it is is subjective like ah granted if that didn't have, i know he wasn't that bad i know it wasn't his best game but he did okay Yep. That doesn't exist in golf. You know, it's like you shot 65 or you shot 75. Yep. And what goes into that is, is really hard. And then in terms of the S&C stuff and coaches picking exercises, one of the reasons why I think that strength is so popular is because, one, nearly all strength and conditioning coaches got into strength and conditioning because they love lifting. They've yep. all had a period where they've spent years trying to get their squat, deadlift, and bench up as high as possible or their yep. clean. Yep. pretty much universally and then the other thing is is that strength is neat and tidy you can look at beautiful percentages on excel sheets and yes. you can present you can present charts to to sport to coaches or managers or whatever and you can say well look he's gone from 100 kg by three reps on the squat to 125 kg by three reps on the squat in this four month period whereas a lot of the stuff that i'm doing with the golfers to be perfectly honest i don't really have a way of measuring if their outputs are improving in the exercise if you yep. think of say band work or some med ball work yes there is ways you can do it, but it's not that easy and it's definitely mm -hmm. not that practical yep. but really what you're trying to do is reverse engineer the the kind of fancy term from is the sporting skill improving like that's the top of your pyramid yep. is this player's club head speed improving does he have enough energy and freshness to practice and play as much as he wants? If that's improving, well, then trickle down. 
what's the least invasive things that I can do to keep that moving. Yep. And if it's not moving, okay, you might need to apply more volume or more stress, but don't start with the stress yes. and, and see it like leave, leave the stress away for as long as possible, you know? A hundred percent, hundred percent. Now, as, as we said, that I want to explore that online stuff. Yeah. So I'll tell you, I still struggle with this. Um, the, the closest I've got, Mike, is to, I do distance training where I'll still see the person. So we've got a real example. I've got a swim up in Cairns, which is a two and a half hour flight away from me. And I see him every six weeks. He'll they'll fly down, spend the weekend. I'll see maybe two sessions or program. And then I'll program quite conservatively because I'm not going to see him. And yes, he sends me videos. So at the three week mark, he sends me videos and, and so forth. But you've got a, a pretty good side income coming in with, a, with your online program. Can you just tell us how you set that up and, and some of yeah. the behind that? Um, it's, it's actually, it's, it's by far my primary income okay. um, by, by, a, by a long stretch. But how I've set it up essentially is out of necessity. When I moved to the US, uh, the job that I was in, probably my own fault, but I was 24 and just wanted to move to the sunshine. Didn't do enough research in terms of the cost of living here, exactly how many hours I'd be coaching in the gym and what I'd be earning. Okay. Figured, out very, figured out very quickly that I didn't like to look <laughs> at the sums and definitely knew that I didn't want to be saying, going back to Ireland after like two or three months after this move to California and saying like, oh, it just didn't work out or whatever. So it came to a point within a couple of months there that I had to do something additional to the job that I was working in to earn some money or I was going to have to go home. That was the reality of it. So I was kind of considering, like, and I was only probably working about 15 hours a week in the gym, but there literally just was not more clients to take on. I was brand new there, so it wasn't like I had a, you know, a network built up of kind of people streaming into me or whatever. So I was considering like bar work was one thing. I was just thinking, would I do something? And then I came across uh, Trainerize, which is a software company that helps trainers do online training. They have an app that can be downloaded to people's phones. Um, you put the links on your website for people to buy the stuff. And in terms of building it, you put you can put your own videos or use their videos on their website. You can build different programs, um, essentially create a training program product and sell it on your website. Mm -hmm. And it was actually the coach who I started working for introduced me to it. He had just started using it for some of his clients. And when I saw that, I was thinking like, okay, maybe this is something that would be a better idea than, you know, like bar work or something like that to try and earn extra cash. So literally what it started with was this was in, um, this was late. So I arrived in the U S in October, 2016, and this would have been from probably November to January of 2016. I just rolled out, um, a 12 week training plan for a golfer, something that I would have used all the time with literally hundreds of golfers in the past. You're, kind of say average uh, recreational golfer say between the age of like 35 and 60 mm -hmm. kind of coming from a pretty low training background and wrote the program and then I just videoed all the exercises for it and okay. I videoed the exercises extremely crudely just on my iPhone in the gym not even using a tripod just honestly setting the phone up against a dumbbell or something like that like really low but there's music on in the background sometimes there was tv on in the background just not really thinking i didn't know essentially what i was doing but got all the exercises together uploaded them to trainerize uh built the program got the product link or whatever and uh created a website on wordpress and started writing some blogs uh which i had done a little bit of before but the big thing was in the blogs and on my website, there was a section where you could buy what I call Fit for Golf 101, which was my entry level 12 week program. And I had uh, a Twitter account, which I'd had while I was in Ireland, same with uh, Facebook and Instagram. So I just started basically doing the same sort of educational and tutorial type social media postings that I'd been doing. 
and but this but now I was able to attach a link to buy a program if you were interested yeah. as opposed yeah. to when I was in Ireland it was come and see me in the gym mm -hmm. I didn't have any of this so I can remember um, I went to a professional golf tournament with four of my buddies and we were there like just for fun we were having a couple of beers walking around watching the golf and I can remember I think I earned about two hundred and twenty dollars in sales while walking around the golf course drinking with my buddies I was getting well, these notifications yeah, okay, okay. oh so why, why are you doing this you get notifications coming through yeah so exactly so I had my phone with me and I was just on a day out with my friends and I was getting these notifications I put out a tweet before I left for the golf tournament like some some kind of montage of the exercises in the video posted it on Twitter and I was like you know if you want to find out more go to the website you can buy the program and within the space of about four or five hours while I'd been out with my buddies having beers there was like $220 came into my account and bear in mind I was how much was the program like, how, how much was the program so I so I've changed it since but basically what I did was um, I had a couple of different options and they range between 29 and 49 at the time. So there was like a phase one, a phase two, and a phase three. Mm -hmm. And you could buy all three phases, buy one phase, or buy two phase. Or buy, yeah, so buy phase one, buy phase two, or buy phase three. And then there are all three of them together. Yeah, sure. And I think at the time it was like 29, 39, and 49 were the options. Mm -hmm. So I must have sold like six or seven programs or something like that to get I think it was roughly like 250 was that came in and at the time I was earning about like 15 or 20 dollars an hour for coaching in the gym so 10 hours and worth of work just right there so uh, honestly once that happens once it sounds like cliched and stuff like that but literally I was just thinking like this is honestly the most ridiculous thing ever like I just earned the same amount of money that I would earn in 10 hours of coaching while I've been out with my buddies for three or four hours and I've done nothing like the, the people have just gone to my website, bought the programs, dug out of them and it's done. That's it. I don't have to do anything. I was thinking like, okay, that's, that's something that I need to, that I need to look into more. And so Mike, I, I just love this because I, I want whoever's listening to this. I want them to think about this because I've got some stuff on Gumroad, which is a um, online selling platform and stuff. And to, I yeah, always I've used it. Okay, okay. And, and like I'll often wake up in the morning and there's three or four emails and I sell one book for forty nine dollars. And I'm trying to it, it's it's not the amount of money. Like this my, mine is definitely not as um it's not as important um stream of income yet. It's just something I'm playing around with. But you think, oh I'm sleeping and I just made hundred and fifty bucks. Like yeah. and I'm trying to get my interns and young coaches and, and people to say, Hey, you don't have to work 16 hours a day. You don't have to be there or, you know, wake up in the dark, going to bed, all this kind of stuff. So I'm so excited to talk about this. Okay, so light bulbs start going off. You are basically a millionaire at this golf course with your 200 yeah. like, relative to where so, you come from. So uh, a, a big night out with the boys on, a, <laughs> on Saturday night with my, with my $200. Um, but yeah, and that, like, that was January that was January 2017, say three three months after I'd moved to the US. I kind of had spent the winter basically, say three months, uh, videoing these programs, putting them together. And I mean, though, like they were really poor quality. I, I put some on YouTube. I put some of the videos on Twitter after this that I used in the first programs. Um, just really low quality, nothing in them. But the way that I was looking at it was uh, like they worked. The, the person who looked at them could see the exercise there was a written instruction with it and they could copy it. Yep. So that, um, that basically kept going. So I earned a little bit more money essentially month on month from doing the same thing. And I was, I'm trying to think that was 2017. That 101 program was the only thing that I sold for all of 2017. And at that stage, it was a uh, side income. I was, I was definitely earning more from my gym hours. Mm -hmm. But it kept and you in the States. Oh yeah, definitely. Like it was, there was no way I would have survived. Well, not, like by saying no way I could have survived now, like I'm like, I could have done something else. You know what yeah, I mean? Sure. Like, it's not like I was in huge danger, like or anything like that. Um, 
but yeah, it was really important basically for say quality of life, rent, having any sort of enjoyment and actually seeing the value in staying there. Um, it's Cal like I'm living in Orange County, California. It's, it's, it's a high cost of living. Mm -hmm. So when you hear someone's wages, you might think, oh, that's pretty good. Then you see what things just cost here and it's, yeah. it's not a lot. Yeah. So then 2000, and so yeah, like the, there was a pretty decent earning for that year but less than I earned from say training people basically, mm -hmm. but not, not that far away. I think it was about 50% okay. of what I, of, of what I earned training people. Then in 2017, what I noticed like a near perfect correlation is the vast majority of my advertising was done via Twitter. Mm -hmm. So every day I try every day on Twitter, or Instagram, give or take a few days, I tried to put up, some video of an exercise with an explanation and why it was useful for golfers. Mm -hmm. and I've been doing this for nearly three years, almost daily. And as the, sorry, I just, I just wanted to talk about your system there. So are you filming daily or do you sort of front end? Oh, no, filming no, no, no. And like then I, just drip feed it out. <laughs> yeah. So the, that, actually that's a good question. And something that I've been asked a few times is like the most valuable thing that I've ever done um, are up there is I bought a, refurbished iPhone seven plus with uh, 256 gigabyte of memory. So it's a huge memory. The phone was about $700, I think. And um, because the memory is so big, I just like, I didn't buy it on a plan or anything, just bought the actual phone. Like you buy a computer and I have rented gyms a couple of times, just make arrangements with them where I can basically fill them in there. And have gotten like friends or whatever to to spend a few hours with me filming and have edited all the videos on the iphone there's been nothing else i've used and like the editing's gotten a lot better like voiceovers subtitles labeling and stuff like that um what was actually interesting is how that phone came about was i started selling this 101 program with the really crappy videos and one of my buddies said to me, I've been doing it for a few months. This was probably uh, kind of midway through 2017. So six months into selling programs online, one of my buddies who's interested in investing and one of his other buddies is really interested in investing. He said, we want to invest in Fit for Golf. Okay. And at this stage, like more as a casual thing now, not like, you know, massive funding or anything, mm -hmm. but that's just one of their hobbies, like kind of putting money into stuff and seeing if they get anything out. And they were both, in very secure like say corporate jobs basically where like they were kind of 25 and you know on, on good money they had a little bit to spare so i think they gave me like fifteen hundred dollars and they said like what do you want to spend it on and i said well I need to film so i got a camera or a phone decided on a phone that worked really well did all the filming with the phone did all the editing and the next thing that I did was uh, kept just the 101 program, but updated all the videos. So yeah. reshot the videos and did the exact same program. Then when things really, really changed uh, in terms of income wise, I kept a reasonably steady side income coming in all the way through 2017 and into 2018. Gradually getting bigger for definite, but it was still just one program was available. Mm -hmm. The social media following was definitely growing from the daily videos. I'd written some uh, TPI articles that they published on their site, which are really helpful. Done some articles on my own website. And then in October of 2018, so about 18 months in or 20 months in, I filmed for, I created, filmed for and released a new program. And I called it the Fit for Golf off-season program. Mm -hmm. Just as it was coming into winter time, which is often when golf kind of closes down. Yep. And I tried a marketing strategy for that program, which I, I didn't know how it would work. Just something I said I'd try for about, I don't know, two or three months beforehand. I was putting up, say, sample videos from the program on Twitter with like, this is what's coming in the Fit for Golf off-season program. If you sign up, it's only going to be available the first week it goes on sale to people who are in my email list. Yep you can sign up for my email list here and you will get a 50% discount. If you're on my email list, you'll have a week to activate the code. And in the first weekend that went on sale, I made something like $11,000, I think. Whoa. And I was just like, holy shit. Like, okay, this is, 
this is pretty serious now. There was like, it was selling for $50. So what's that, like 200 or 250 sales, roughly <clears throat> something like that in the first weekend. And I was like, all right, that completely changes things. Like that's, this is a big deal. And since that weekend, basically, that that program went on sale, which was November or uh, October 2018, that's when the online stuff was really, I was like, okay, there's big potential for this year. I know I had the Fit for Golf 101 and the Fit for Golf off-season program for sale. So when people were coming, it was like, if you were a beginner, you get the 101. If you're used to training or you've already done, I've already taken $50 for you for the 101. Now you can give me another $50 for the next installment because there was lots of people saying the program is really good. What do I do next? And I was like, uh, just keep, just keep doing the one you have. Mm-hmm. Whereas when I released a new one, say, I don't know how many people bought that first one. I'd have to check, but let's just say if there was 500 people bought it in the first year and a half, it was available. There was a large proportion of them also rebought and got the off season pr- program. And Mike, this is all through trainerize. You sticking with this the is, same same thing all through trainer is just built a new program it's extremely simple like what's hard is the video recording and the video editing like there's no doubt about it you and and can you tell us are you using trainerize that you filming with your iphone 7 yeah what what are you using to edit well what app i i I use the app called video shop um which is a paid app or free it's it's paid for the pro version it's like four dollars a month i think and that gives you uh, just access to some better features on it, like uh, voiceovers and kind of putting your own logo in the videos mm-hmm. and using some of the kind of fancy titles that you'd see flash across the screen, like, you know, back squat, you know, okay. phase one or whatever. Um, so essentially, as I had the two programs available, that went really well. Um, I learned very quickly then that there was a market like this, yeah. this stuff is definitely potential. And that was in, um, October, 2018 in 29th. And like they sold like that program and the one one sold well for about the next year. Basically there was new people coming to say my Twitter and website, seeing that the program was available, buying it. And I was trying my best to say share testimonials of people sending me back emails of the program was great, feel way better, et cetera, et cetera. But I didn't use any paid advertising at all. Like never paid for a Facebook or Twitter ad, just, just sharing basically examples, answering questions and stuff like that. And then where I'm getting with this is a year later, I released a third program, which was called fit for golf, super speed. Um, that went that first weekend, went better than the off season oh. weekend. Yeah. So, and I kind of knew at this point, I kind of knew it would be mm-hmm. where I was confident that it would, because I had a good idea, but so then I had three programs for sale and I had way more content say put together. So what became really important then though, and why things sort of had a big jump this year in terms of sort of income and it being my, by far my primary income was like 2017 it earned about 50 percent of what i earned from coaching mm-hmm. in 2018 they were about equal and then in 2019 i earned double from online that i earned from coaching people um and literally there was a hunt like the three years uh, uh 17 18 19 the online income doubled each year which i was looking at it and i was like okay this is this is something that's worth pursuing. I know it's it's still work. Like it's not a case of yeah, yeah. it's not it's passive. not it, it's not it's it's not just Saturdays out with the lads uh, drinking beers on the golf course and yeah. and there's this money coming in. Like there's loads of time goes into the editing, the social media stuff, the answering questions, etc. And there's also some costs involved in terms of paying trainer rays, paying whatever. Um, mm-hmm. But not 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 that much. But there is there is some costs involved, but more so time. And then when things really changed was... But, but, but can I just also say, and this is what I want to change people's mindset, is that time that you invest becomes so leveraged because that yeah. one hour you spent videoing, six years later, you could still get paid for, for that. And, and that's yeah. the, this mindset that I think, you know, my, I wrote an ebook 
Uh, actually, just as a, <laughs> I'll tell you, this is a bit embarrassing to admit on air, but I've got an ebook. My, my first one that I did is I got my 100 top tweets, yeah. copied and pasted them into a PDF and sold it for $4.99. And yeah. I made over 200 bucks <laughs> yeah. from something that people, and it, I'm, I'm laughing because of how, how available it is, how simple it can be. And that's just a tweet thing. And that's just, but yeah, you, it, you know, like you just need those, you need that weekend that you had with the boys to be able to go, Oh wow, this is, this is real. Like I can do yeah, this. Definitely. And like what you're talking about there in terms of sort of leveraging time is like something that I know for certain I got a, I got a, a re, like a, a really good mentor of mine when I was in Cork before I moved, his name was uh, John Cork. I actually just did a podcast episode with him. Yes. On Monday where I spoke to him on, on my podcast I'm still really good friends with him. He's 50 and um, really successful trainer. He's actually a, a master sprint champion in Ireland. But he said to me when I was coming up in fitness work, he was the owner of the gym and the trainer there. And he was, he'd always talk to me about kind of what my plans were when I would say early twenties, like, what do you want to do? And I was really interested in training people. And at the time, and not that it's not cool, it was extremely cool, but it wasn't well paid. Was I got some work with say county GAA teams. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, I'm the strength and conditioning coach for the Cork team. Like this is this is pretty cool. Like that's, and I would say, uh, pretty busy with just regular personal training clients and say charging forty dollars an hour or forty euro an hour or whatever. Mm-hmm. So when you're 22 or three and all your expenses are is paying rent in the house that you're renting with three of your friends, you feel like you're making tons of money and it is yes. good money. Don't get me wrong, but really quickly what he was saying to me he was like you're gonna get in he was like if you don't decide what you're gonna do and maybe change something you're gonna get to a stage where you're very comfortable now and it's very fun but the opportunity is to increase your income if you need to and want to like if you want to get a house or you start having a family are very very small and since then and kind of what we talked about was that you can either increase your prices you can increase the amount of hours that you train people. You can own a gym and hire people. They're really the only three things that you have. I had no interest in opening and owning a gym and dealing with the overheads at that time, like in my early 20s. One thing that I knew for absolute certain was that I didn't want to coach more hours. Like the easiest way, and most people get into training because they enjoy training themselves. The easiest way to want to get out of it is to spend 10 hours a day in the gym, bringing people through workouts. And especially where I've basically hit a roadblock with my coaching now and have been for the last couple of years is that spending time with people who are very nice people, uh, you're, even if you're earning reasonably good hourly rates, but I felt like that my time there was just unnecessary mm-hmm. in that I'd been helping these people for say six months a year. I was no longer coaching them are 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 giving them guidance as such they were coming to me because maybe they enjoyed the company and they got the odd tip but mainly because they had paid for the training session and it was now an appointment in their calendar yep. and they didn't want to let me down or cancel the session so they would come but i'm basically standing there making small talk with them i'm not doing anything to improve as a coach I'm not doing anything to expand my own learning or work on any of my own projects. And I just have not hit that or experienced it with any of the online stuff. If you're like, I think most people like being sort of challenged in, in what they do for work or feel like they're getting better at it. And for essentially three or four years work again, like working with really nice people, but not getting better at anything yeah. at all. Like yeah. wasn't making good money. was not prog- progressing in income was definitely not progressing at a co- as a coach. I was, mm-hmm. I was coaching at a level that I could have coached at years earlier, but with the online stuff, there was obviously a big monetary aspect of it, which was, holy shit, I can earn really, really good money here, way more than I would have imagined when I started doing this. But I also actually genuinely do enjoy the process of how can I lay out a program here that thousands of people can follow either in a gym or at home, it's going to help them with their body composition and their golf. And then also learning something that I didn't do in college and I didn't really have experience in. So it was basically a beginner 
which is which is fun too. We all like kind of getting better at stuff in the early stages sort of the online business and marketing and, and development stuff like that. And that's why I've kind of kept going with the online stuff. Like, yes, definitely. Like it is, it is about the money a hundred percent. Um, but also the fact that like, it is genuinely kind of cool and interesting to work on it and really rewarding too. Like when you get emails or messages from people who you've never met and they're like, the program was great. You know, my, my back used to kill me after golf and now it's great. Or, I I got a college scholarship and some of it was due to adding 15 yards in the last year or whatever. But the last thing on time and regards to kind of leveraging it was the, the change I made in the, in the selling plans on the app this year. Yep, was, yep. So when I released that third program, Fit for Golf Super Speed, I now had 101 off season and super speed. So I was making money by new, pe- by new people buying their first program or by repeat buyers buying um, a second or third program. Mm-hmm. So I was relying on sales all the time, like selling off programs. You can't keep releasing new programs because mm-hmm. you're, just, you're just putting the same stuff in, in different packaging and kind of basically lying to people. So once I felt like I had enough content together and also like I, it's not a huge amount of money, but I have to pay train raise every month to keep someone's account active on the app. Once mm-hmm. you've over 300 on it, it, it stabilizes. It doesn't matter if you've 300 or 5,000, but you need to make sure you cover that. So the way I was looking at it is that like if I sell someone a program and the program's 12 weeks long and they're on the, on the app, if their app account lasts for five years, like they're going to have time where they're accessing your app, but you're actually not making any more money from them. If you get yep. me. Yep, yep. So basically once I felt like I had enough content available and I've added kind of smaller sections to it as well, like home workouts, hotel room workouts, uh, basically put all rather than selling individual products, I put them all under one roof Mm -hmm. and started selling a subscription. So, and so now like, and those, those individual programs were going for roughly between say 79 and $99 for a 12 week program which is a reasonably decent outlay for someone when they don't really know what they're getting. But I switched to a subscription model at the start of 2020 this year, where I had all my training material as one product, but it was a subscription rather than a program purchase. And it was $12 a month or $120 a year. And that was definitely the best decision I made in terms of finances because people are very happy to sign up to something for $12 a month. It's like Netflix or Amazon prime or something like that. And if they feel like they're getting enough value for $12 a month, which is really easy to rationalize with someone, if you compare it to something like coffee or beer, Mm -hmm. um, they'll stick with it. And that's been, and it also kind of takes the pressure off in terms of you're not constantly trying to make new sales because if, if you have a certain amount of subscriptions, you kind of have a good idea that that's coming in again the next month. Yep. And then all you're really trying to do is like from month one to month two, do I have more, like you're going to get cancellations, no doubt about it, but you're hoping in month two, do I have more subscriptions than I had in month one? And in yep. month three, do I have broader than when you're just selling programs? If you sell a hundred programs in month one, those 100 programs are not being sold again in month two. Sure. Now, fair enough, the initial price is bigger, but it's not the same of kind of being able to say like, okay, I have X numbers of subscribers, I'm pretty certain that this percentage of them are also going to be here next month. So I can kind of know that that money is coming. Like it's, it's the yeah. recurring revenue that you're looking for. And if you can start to develop that, I think it's, it's definitely the way to go. And it works out better for, for like coach or, or say owner. And also I think the, the person signing up because like a 12, obviously everyone's finances are, di- are different, but something like 10, $12 a month, people can rationalize as being a a pretty good deal. Whereas if someone's like $99 for a 12 week program, I'm not so sure. But if you can prove with testimonials and whatnot, that like these are the types of results or feedback the app is getting, you only have to try one month for $12. But then there's a really good chance that someone's signing up to that. And if they like it a little bit, maybe they'll sign up for three or four months. Maybe they'll say, I'm not going to use it for the summertime. I'm going to be traveling a lot and playing golf all the time, but I'm going to sign up again in, in, in October when the yeah. weather gets bad and trying to look at it that way, basically. Oh my God. And 
have, have you have you had to fight any of like inner demons with this that you know strength and conditioning we, we don't like the term selling marketing sales how, how have you gone from that side like when you when you boil it down like ev everybody likes making money like there's 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 like it's there's clear reasons for for why being able to earn more money is is positive for you and and for your family you know like it's it's not complicated in that regard and the the main thing like that it came down to for me and again it's kind of like cliche you read it in the the self help books or the instagram inspirational memes is that to be honest it was it's it's mainly about looking at freedom like yeah. i know for certain that i don't want to be in a gym for 40 hours a week personal training yeah. i just have no interest in doing it i've done it like not saying that it's a bad thing to be doing it's a it's a really noble job you're you're helping people but i just got to a stage where i felt like that the vast majority of my time the way i explained it to people was if i left the gym open and left the person's program on the table they could do the exact same quality of work and i don't need to be there yep. and i was doing that and have been doing that for say 20 30 40 hours a week whereas you can set something up have it earn money it still takes work but then you can also just have your own schedule go and do whatever you want and you're not relying on hourly rates you're not you're not saying if i'm sick for a week i miss out on my 500 dollars of training income for that week it's like no the app is still or whatever you're selling that doesn't require your time is still is still turning over you know um and that's the big thing for me like is it just opened up it opened up essentially like opportunities to to earn income that's not dependent on it's scalable is the word i'm looking for yes, yeah. to earn to earn more money there's not an exact uh increase in me needing to spend more time to do it which is the case with training people and i was just getting pretty sick of that and the fact that i wasn't learning whereas like having a solid income from that being able to expand into other things you want to do and just not be relying on having to be in a certain place at a certain time to earn an hourly rate and if i'm being honest just do something that i had close to zero interest in doing like the person i might be meeting is a very nice person i like really wish them all the best with their health and fitness goals but I'm just getting very little satisfaction or motivation from doing it week in and week out and noticing that my own quality of coaching was getting worse, like disinterest. It's based and some of that comes down to the client. If it's just at a level where they're happy to just maintain, there's no real clear goals. There's no problem solving from the coach going on. And really the reason you're there is because the person just prefers working out with a trainer and doesn't have the discipline to do it themselves. Whereas it was, I want to be, like seeing if I can impact someone's performance or really just doing things that I have a, a passion and interest for. And at the moment, definitely like I, I don't have a passion to be in a gym for 40 hours a week and doing the exact same stuff that I have been doing since I was 18. And also working hard, putting a lot of time and effort in and still only doing okay financially. Yep. So Mike, I've got a question though. Because I'm going through a similar sort of thing, but would you say, would you have been able to do this as an 18 year old, or was that working with people, understanding them, problem solving, a, a, a necessary foundation for you to be able to go online? Like I'm just worried no, like, that some people might go straight online and think that's the way to go. No, like so the the thing that i the reason why i still work think that things have worked out quite well and the other thing that's important is like there's no guarantee that if we have this same conversation in a year or in two years that i'll be saying the app is going great things are still going really well i might be saying in two years like shit the app is after going to shit i need hours and people and stuff you know what i mean like yeah. there's no guarantee that you just don't know like if if twitter shut down tomorrow i'd be in trouble you yeah. know what i mean like that's that's a reality, like, uh, which is weird, but it is, it is 100% true. Not that I'd be in trouble, but I'd have to have a, it would be a major inconvenience for me if something happened with social media where you had to like, say, pay a lot of money to have your stuff on there or 
like there was some say I don't know stuff came in that made that more difficult basically but no like the reason why I think things have gone well is like at say 25 when I started doing this I still had six years of training experience actually working as a coach under my belt I'd become like in my opinion or whatever like extremely good at performing and explaining exercises Mm -hmm. and I'd also spent a lot of time refining the programs and things like that which I would not have been able to do when I initially started training so the experiences I had there definitely and then the other thing is it's like it's like if you work in a in a minimum wage job that you hate when you're in in high school to earn some cash you quickly learn all right I better go to college and get some education or this is what I'm doing after I finish my exams that's some that's a progression that a lot of people have and then the next one for me was like I just don't want to be doing this. This is, I'm not enjoying my job. Like I love training. These people are nice, but I just don't want to be here. That's it. Like I driving into the gym at 4 PM in the evening on there until 8 PM. There's an infinite amount of other things that I would rather do. And that might sound bad. It's not like that's terrible. And it's definitely a first world problem. But being honest with yourself, it was like, I don't want to go here. Like I'm not looking forward to getting ready for work, driving in, and putting on the game face for four hours here where I pretend like, you know, I'm really into these training sessions. Some of that is because you're not getting it from the client. They're just yeah. there to essentially tick off their exercise box. Yeah. But you need to be, that's, that's their hour of the week where they're expecting you to put on the performance because they're paying you a certain amount per hour. Whereas I was just struggling with it. And now that's completely different. It's not a case of that I don't like training people. If I'm training someone or have been asked to help someone that is clearly extremely eager for knowledge and needs information to help their training. That's completely different. Like I'm, I'm all in on trying to create a better program, see them in person, coach them, try and help them. But the, the big thing with the programs was, was that I felt that this program can be taken by pretty much anybody and it eliminates their need for a personal trainer unless their goals are extremely specific. They can just follow this on their phone for way cheaper, get probably the same results and do it in their own time. And Mike, I think one of the key things there that you, that's coming through is, is it, this is just giving you options. Um, you can then pick and choose. So the person who needs you as an appointment because it's, they're not motivated or disciplined to be able to keep this up compared to the person who wants to maximize a session. When yeah. you don't have a side income, you've got to take both or you've got to take what you get. But when 100%. you've got the side income coming in and, and in your case where it's your, maybe even your main source of income and like, you know, since Corona, I, I stopped doing one-on-one sessions a number of years ago. Um, but now I've actually opened myself up and I've got a bunch of these young athletes. I've got a 13 year old girl who's um, a swimmer and I want to do this. It's not yeah. the best investment of my time. It's just a passion. She is really good. She's buying in week to week. And so I, I get to do that. But if someone wants me just because they need a time or something like that, well, then that's, I'll just, yeah. I'm, not, I'm going to choose no, not to work with that person. It's there, like, there's, there's no, there's no way to butter it up. Like, and I think something that's definitely prevalent in S and C are, personal training which probably isn't quite the same in kind of the corporate world is that people are uncomfortable talking about money Mm. like it's and I think it's a huge hurdle that people need to try and get over in that in that line of work is very rarely will you hear somebody talk about what they're earning per week or earning per hour or whatever and I can understand why people you know don't want to be talking about it people definitely don't want to be seen to be you know flaunting that they're earning lots of money or whatever but the main reason that you're working is for your income. Like that's, that's something that needs to be understood. And if you're not doing something that you really enjoy, unless you're getting loads of money that makes it seem like it's worth your while or basically keeps you doing it, it's very hard to justify it. Like if you're not really enjoying your job and you're also not getting the huge perks of having massive freedom and security from a lot of money in the bank, it's really tough to keep doing it yep. um, and can almost put you off it if it was say a hobby that you did enjoy. So that's, that's basically what it's come down to for me. Like, is that I, I don't 
really enjoy the grind of of monotonous personal training sessions anymore and also can see scope for better income with with a more enjoyable lifestyle from from following the online thing basically and if that doesn't work out or if i stop enjoying it maybe there's something else that i'll do but like you're right in terms of stuff that you enjoy like i'm i play golf with with some of my buddies and like a couple of my friends i've literally just say gone to the driving range with and done practice sessions with where i've coached them for an hour just helping them like obviously for free and like i'm i look forward to that you know what i mean like i'm not getting paid for it but i'm genuinely happy yes i can't wait to see how you know so and so is doing this week like has he improved from last week because you also know that that person is hungry for the information that you're going to be able to give them Mm -hmm. as opposed to going to gym sessions sometimes you just know exactly what's going to happen the person's going to come in they're going to warm up you're going to bring them through the same exercises you've already coached them through for the last six months Mm -hmm. you're going to make small talk about what's going on in professional golf and professional baseball Uh, they're going to say thank you very much and they're going to leave next they're going to come back at the same time next week there's nothing wrong with that at all like no way i'm not saying there is but it came to a point for me where i was thinking i just not that i can't keep doing this i definitely could keep doing it if i had to do it for money 100 percent. but when you don't if you find there's something else that you can do to cover your financial needs and it gives you way more freedom it's just it's just very hard to do i think your your sort of eyes get opened to to other possibilities and and definitely like I was lucky in terms of that when I was doing it, it was also just myself I was looking after. So I, I had no kids and I was single. So I could spend as much time as I want did doing it. I didn't have to have, say, a safety net of cash for for diapers and food. You know what I mean? It was yep, just, yep. let's give this a crack, see how it goes. And yeah, as I said, there's no guarantees with anything with it. Like it's it's not secure as such, but... You just kind of have to to try and figure something out, I suppose, if if you're put in a situation where it's nece- necessary, or if you just don't like what you're doing, you want to do something different. I think try and try and find out what you can do, and it's it's definitely a lot easier with with social media and smartphones and stuff like that now. Like the especially in S and C, because like if you're an S and C coach, you also know what people need for health and fitness. There's always going to be a fitness problem like people it's something that people will always need so like my i suppose my only kind of advice would be to people is even if you feel like you're not experienced as a strength and conditioning coach or a personal trainer just get into your head that if you're working as a personal trainer your options are increase your prices work more hours put more people into the same hour or employ people and all of those like that's it there's nothing else you can do all of those have limitations and all of them to earn more money require more of your time so more of your freedom gone whereas if you can develop something and sell it so that it's scalable and work on that over time that's something that that time it's not gone once you do it like once you do a personal training session that fifty dollars is gone you need to do another one to get another fifty dollars and it's it's directly proportional how much time you do is how much money you make. Yep. If you can do something where there's not more and more time invested with more and more income, I think it's something that's really important for people to try and do. Even if they feel like they're not, say, ready for it, just get practice of, think about, basically, like everyone will have something where they'll see a shortcoming in whatever they're working in. Like, why, why is everybody struggling with the same thing? Why is there nobody talking about this? Mm-hmm. It's not that hard to come up with the with what you think is a is a solution for it, and then find a way to sell it. Like, yep. don't 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 be afraid to to see that people or don't be afraid that people can see that you're trying to sell something and make money. It's like, are you trying to make money by selling this? Yes, I am. That is exactly the reason I'm doing it. I want to make more money because yep. more money is is gives me freedom. You know what I mean? More more money doesn't directly make my life better but it can go a long way towards making you more comfortable and less stressed. 100%. 100%, Mark. Hey, but, uh, look, sorry, I, I am conscious of your time. We've been no, talking for an yeah. hour and 23 minutes, and um, 
Mark, I actually think, sorry, so we want to touch on sort of two-ish things that I wanted to touch on. I reckon we've got to, let's stop here and maybe we catch up again because there's yeah, so many things and I think there's so many lessons. I, I wish I'd listened to this chat 20, uh, I say I, I wish I'd learned these things 20 years ago, but I don't think I was ready to. So yeah, like, and I think that's the thing for me too, like, is that some of it is just, I suppose, luck or just the way things pan out in terms of like what happens. So for example, if I had stayed in Ireland, I definitely wouldn't have done the online thing. No way. Yeah. Because yeah. I was popular as an SNC coach. Some of the teams that I've been working with had success. And what would have happened, I'm almost certain is I would have started working with higher profile teams, earning slightly more money. And for a 20 something year old with no kids, it would have felt like loads of money. I'd have been in a really comfortable spot, you know? And then the other thing that I was thinking of is I'm lucky that the American job opportunity came up when I was so young and was so naive because if I'd actually done proper research <laughs> into how much money I would have earned or how much, or how much money it would have cost to live here, I just wouldn't have come. Yep. You know, I would have just, I would have said, no, screw that. I'm earning more money here. Like I'm, I'm, I can't come there and do that. But literally what I was saying moving there was, and I'm lucky in the fact that like, you know, supportive parents, if I got into, you know, huge financial difficulty, I would have been in, basically I was going to be able to get a flight home either way. Yeah. Like someone was going to give me $600 for a flight home. Um, but I was able to just go and pretty quickly it was like, okay, shit, this is basically not how things can go long-term. What do I do? And like definitely not starting off four years ago did I think I'd be going here now like you know and even what was crazy too like in terms of the online stuff is that literally be direct like it's it's kind of more social media and say the possibilities of that than selling but um when the coronavirus started you know or became kind of blew up in America the PGA tour was shut down and pre-coronavirus i had zero pga tour players who were using the fit for golf app or i'd had any correspondence with except for one i'd had one phone call with um and since the coronavirus to now directly as a result solely of like social media postings and putting out free educational content there's six pga tour players one european tour player and two seniors tour players using the app which without social media or the coronavirus is just impossible. Like that's, that's not going to happen. And it's, it's one of those things again, that just shows if you look into kind of leveraging the things that are available, i.e. your ability to sell stuff online now and your ability to contact essentially anyone based on a, a social media profile, not that it's going to be immediate or that it will always be perfect or that it's something everyone should do. But like, there's no doubting that there is way more opportunity to to do stuff than there was without it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, hundred percent agree with that. Well, I'm gonna. This is gonna be compulsory listening to in my um, in in my internship program because my one of the things that I know I've I've said twice, so we've got to end there. But one of the things that I, I, I actually have to, I actually have to go to the gym shortly. The clients. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that um, I've noticed is with my own evolution and my ability to, say, to be honest with myself and say, hey, I actually want to have money. I've got a family I need to provide. And more than just provide, I want to take them on yeah. holidays and do things yeah. and have the freedom that you talked about. But the one thing I've noticed is in the last sort of five or six years discussing new, um, finances, marketing, sales to interns, I have to do it really early on in the internship program because once they become a paid coach and they start, they become where you could have been mm -hmm. in Ireland if you'd stayed yeah. there because they get, they get onto this treadmill and the only way to move up is more experience, more hours, more qualifications. Um, and me suggesting, whispering, yelling, saying, hey, think about these other things. Oh, no, no, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I've well, got to get the yeah. next step. And the other thing too, like when you're starting off as a trainer or a coach, your big fear is not having clients and not being busy. So when you see your appointment book filling up, it's almost like a badge of honor. Oh, sweet. I'm really busy this week. I've got 
42 coaching sessions. You know what I mean? Whereas it's very hard for someone who's new and upcoming to say, no, I'm actually like, they're, they're not going to say, no, I'm, I'm not taking any more clients. Mm-hmm. I have enough. Or it's going to be hard for someone who's very new, say an intern to say, no, you can't come at three o'clock, but if you want to, you can pay me two thirds of the rate and come at two o'clock and train with this other person. You know what I mean? And then in another three months, say you can pay me 50% of the rate and you can train with two other people because by now you don't need as much of my supervision. You just see people hours and try and build it up. And then all of a sudden it's, it's very hard to to backtrack. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mike, I I really appreciate your time. You've got to go to the gym. I'm going to ruminate on this. Uh, um, let's do this again. We've, we've got a yeah, bunch of other definitely. things to look. And I'm keen to find I'd out how, to... how you go and how you grow from here. That'll be an interesting thing, interesting part too. But thanks me, for your me honesty. Too. Me, me, me too. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but that's also the exact, exciting part. And because you've lost those or you've broken away from those barriers or those chains, um, I, I think it would just be up. It might not be in a straight line, but it'll, over the long term, it'll just be up. We'll see. I'll keep, I'll keep trying anyway. Yeah. Mike. All right. Thanks a lot. All right. Talk soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye.